I had a student reach out and wanted some feedback on this stylized piece. I pretty much broke down the whole process on improving this piece and getting a result that looks like this. In this video, I'm gonna be breaking down my thought process when creating stylized works, how you can take an existing render into Photoshop and apply these design principles of stylized pieces to really just push the stylization of your work and I'll also be giving you some bonus 3D modeling tips. So not only this ended up being a portfolio review, but a value packed video where you will get everything from stylized concept art to 3D modeling tips. All that in the video coming up. What's going on you 3D modeling beast? This is JL Musi, and today I'm going to be doing a portfolio review. This is an additional feature of my Maya 3D modeling course. This is something that I do to help you guys out, uh, to push your art and to bring more value to you guys in the course as well. If you think you might be interested in my Maya 3D modeling course and also getting your portfolio review, I will have a link in the description down below. So in this video, I'm going to be doing a couple of different things. One is I'm going to actually point out the uh, specific characteristics of stylized buildings, uh, each by its own element. Secondly, I'm going to look at her work. And then thirdly, I'm going to jump into Photoshop and show you guys how you can take a render and actually photo manipulate it to look closer to your end goal and make sure you stay all the way to the end because I have a bonus tip that's gonna be showing you a great nifty little tool that I use in Maya, but actually is available in most 3D packages to really help uh, take your uh, buildings and really just give them a stylized flair. So this piece comes by the way of Monique. She hit me up in the private group and she wanted me to take a look at this piece for her and give her some advice. So looking at this concept, I'm gonna take it that you were going for more of a stylized piece. Usually when I'm looking for stylization, stylized pieces, I usually uh, like to see what's worked, right? Designs that have worked and really just break it down into elements that I can implement into my own design, right? And I like to go to ArtStation. So for example, uh, you know, uh, I would go to ArtStation, look for stylized houses. And I pulled up some examples that have worked well. So here's a successful stylized piece. Uh, and a lot of these kind of have some of the main components. Uh, one of them is that they tend to have this flare, uh, this squash and stretch almost look, right? Um, if, if you've done animations, you know what I'm talking about, where, uh, you know, stylized characters kind of have this squash and stretch animation or properties to them. But uh, buildings or designs, also have this as well right you can see that the buildings usually start out very thin at the bottom and they kind of flare out right they they stretch out and they usually have uh kind of almost like a bed right if you look at this one here and even uh something like this it's more evident you, you kind of have this a uh, curvature and they flare towards the top the other thing that um kind of makes these work as well is these little uh, props or localized detail, right? That really just break up the building. And it's really just a balancing act between the textures, right? Or some of the breakup in the flatter areas and also uh, the details here. So you wanna kind of spread out the detail. You don't wanna bombard the viewer with detail. You wanna have areas of rest like here, right? So visually these areas, not much is going on, but then you kind of pick and choose uh, your battles with props and also with details of breaking up these larger panels. Look at kind of what you had and uh, kind of take some of those into account. So one of the things is I would probably uh, add a couple more props. Um, this is very linear. So I would definitely add, you know, a little bit of curvature uh, to this piece, kind of that squash and stretch that I talked about earlier. Uh, and then also break up, right? A break up in these flat areas. So maybe this roof could have got more break up uh, this slide. So uh, that is pretty much the design. And then uh, let's actually look at your modeling work. So I think your modeling work is very uh, well executed. 
uh, and it was just based off the design, right? So anytime that you're doing a design or your own concept and your own modeling, your model is only going to be as good as that design. So usually my recommendation is not to uh, tackle both at the same time, meaning don't tackle creating your own concepts or tackle a 3D, learning 3D model at the same time, right? Get good at either one. So if you want to become a better 3D modeler, what I would do is actually go through ArtStation. There are plenty of super talented concept artists that really don't mind you uh, creating uh, concepts based on the work. Uh, I think it's a good uh, strategy just to ask them, right? Like, hey, this is, uh, I'm such and such. This is what I'm doing here. Um, can I please uh, use your concept? And I also would like to tell them that you will credit them uh, once you create that piece for their concept artwork. But back to the modeling side, I think everything was well executed, right? Uh, this is uh, mainly done with modeling. So to really push this piece, you would need to probably do some texturing and kind of break some of this, uh, some of these larger flat areas up. Uh, but I, I really like just the overall polish of this. I think execution wise on the modeling side, you, you did pretty good uh, on this model. Um, e even this uh, slide here and even the way you kind of cut out this, I actually really like. I really like this glass panel here. This, you, there's really not much pinching. So uh, execution wise, I think you did great on the modeling side. I think the concept could have been pushed a little further. The background is a little distracting. This happens a lot with uh, beginner 3D artists is they usually have this uh, background plane and it kind of creates this harsh contrast between pretty much the uh, black void that's there because there's no plane there and the kind of that floor plane you're having that. So that linear line is a little bit distracting. Um, this student right here, uh, Kotsu, hopefully I'm saying his name right, uh, he posted an update on his bike um, and you can see how well this is uh, working. So I'm a big fan of these um, plain backgrounds, uh, kind of more of a desaturated uh, tone, like something like a desaturated blue. I think this works well. He even added a, a vignette here, right? Which I think uh, works very well. And, you know, I, I even said that I love the background and, and the vignette, right? Uh, and this is something that uh, I think works well. Uh, I incorporate it into a, a lot of my uh, previous artworks. It's kind of more of a plain a background, right? Something with a vignette. Um, same thing here. Uh, I think that really uh, helps to pop the character or your uh, foreground object from the background. So you really don't want something that's busy. So right now I'm jumping over to Photoshop. This is not gonna be a full blown Photoshop tutorial, but I will walk you through my decision making and I will also uh, name some of the tools that I'm using in the process. First order business is to actually take out that distracting background, like I mentioned earlier. And my weapon of choice here for uh, separating the foreground and the background is using layer masks. So usually what I'll do is I'll use a combination of the magic wand tool and also the lasso tool to basically just make a selection around my foreground object and then once that is selected you click that layer mask button and it automatically creates a layer mask around that selection white is going to include black is going to include if you work in a package like substance painter this works the same exact way for the vignette that you see in the background i also like to use layer masks uh, a lot of times i'll actually take that layer mask to soften it i'll apply a gaussian blur now i'm starting the process of giving this uh, building that outward flare that little bit of deformation that i talked about earlier which is a key component of stylized buildings and i'm doing this with the warp deformer within photoshop and you could find that under edit transform and warp in this part of the process, I'm going to be actually using images to add more elements that are going to strengthen this stylized concept. The first one is going to be these roof tiles. And the whole reasoning behind this is that I want to break up some of these larger areas. So you never want to have a really large area with no texture detail. So that's the reason that I'm dropping these roof tiles right here and I'm using uh, the actual transform tool if you hold on control in Windows and you click on those dots 
um, you are actually able to skew at perspective or move those corners accordingly. Uh, again, I'm adding uh, uh, this little crate here and this is just used as a prop. And then lastly, uh, you see me that I'm adding this little floor pedestal and uh, floor pedestals. Uh, these actually are a very common theme, not only in stylized buildings, but you actually see these in collectibles as well. And I think they really help ground your piece in somewhat uh, its own reality. So I'm entering the last stretch of this, which is gonna be pretty much texturing this 2D image. So you could texture things in 3D, you could actually texture things in 2D as well. I found images and what I'm looking for is to actually find images uh, that are black and white, uh, usually grunge materials. You can just go on Google, search for grunge textures, and I'm able to overlay these. I'll take the images and I like to combine them, blend them together, uh, usually using uh, different layer masks and I'll blend between them, then merge the layer, and then play around with the proper blend mode and also the strength that I want to blend it at. A lot of times I'll start out real strong and then kind of blend it back down so it's not overpowering or being too distractive. So the overall thought process here is to just add a little bit of breakup to the larger areas with this uh, grunge and then go in a little deeper into like a localized level and think about areas where dirt naturally builds up. So surfaces that meet up, usually that's a good area in the real world where grime and dirt would build up naturally, right? That's why I focus a little bit more dirt on pretty much the uh, top of this roof area where it meets the uh, upper walls. And then also at the bottom of this oval where the slide is, uh, I'm adding some drips, right? Maybe the rain hits it, it kind of drips down and then leaves that stain. So I add all this grunge and then with layer mask and uh, tweaking the opacity, I'm knocking it back down. This is very similar if you've done texturing and substance painter, a lot of these dirt masks are, are initially tied into the ambient occlusion pass, right? And the ambient occlusion pass is where two surfaces are gonna be strongest where the two surfaces actually meet. In the last part of this process, I'm gonna be using uh, a repeating element to actually uh, tie in the pedestal together. So a lot of times designers come up with designs and they take one element and they spread it throughout different parts to make a cohesive design, right? So I'm always keeping an eye out from where I can borrow a element throughout the piece and put it somewhere else in another part to tie in the design all together. So here I'm just adding a rectangle, adding an outer glow with a layer style, and then I'm also adding a little bit of bounce light, right? So this long rectangular light, it's probably gonna project onto the crate and onto the building itself. So with another layer, I'm basically just painting on it and then knocking it down a little bit and it's just gonna create a little bit of bounce light to tie everything together. Lastly, let's get to this bonus tip. So this is a quick way of getting a rectangular or square building and adding some of that flair. This is using a deformer called a lattice. Most 3D modeling packages have some sort of flair or flavor of a lattice built within it. Where in Maya, I modeled a very quick and basic building just to show you the power of a lattice and how you can quickly achieve uh, this stylized look if you already modeled a square rectangular building. So I'm gonna go ahead and select the building here. Now, one thing that is important is to make sure that uh, you are freezing your transforms. So um, if maybe I have some values here, uh, this is not gonna go well with the deformer. So anytime that you use a deformer, it's just a good practice to clear those out and to freeze your transforms. You can go to modify here and then freeze transforms and you see that um, all your transforms will be frozen and reset. Now from here, I'll simply go to deform and I will use a lattice and I know that uh, Maya does have a flare, which is kind of similar, but I do like the lattice deformer better in this scenario. So I'll go to lattice here, click that, and we see that we have a base and a lattice. So if we go here to the uh, properties, uh, we can go ahead and up the divisions. So maybe uh, we can go to eight here 
and you see that these uh, get upped. So depending on where you need the divisions for the lattice, uh, you could input these values. But I think eight uh, looks pretty good. Uh, so now we can go ahead and right click on the lattice. So the way I'm gonna work with this former is I'm gonna select all these lattice points here. I wanna make sure that I pretty much select them all, but the last uh, bottom ones. And then I can take this filter here because I don't really don't want to scale in the Y at this point. And this is basically going to scale in the X and in the Z axis. And I'm just going to scale slightly outward like this. Then deselect this row. Scale. Deselect. Scale. And um, I could actually do this on the side view as well. So I'm basically uh, deselecting and scaling further out. And you see this gives me a lot of control the way that this is deforming, right? And at any point, we could always go back in here and kind of finagle these, maybe go in here and even uh, push this down a little bit further. Uh, another uh, nice feature of the lattice is that if you like uh, soft select, so we could enable this, right? Select these and we can go in our soft select option you see that we already enabled it. So now we can basically take those bottom ones and just give it a fall off. And you see I'm playing here with the fall off and I just double click the select tool to enable that. And you see that's giving me a real nice effect of using the lattice in combination with the fall off. So uh, one thing about the lattice, it is an active deformer currently. So if you delete it, uh, your shape will snap back to the original. So it is important once the changes are done that you go in here and do edit, delete by type, history, and now that's baked in. And here's our building. And obviously I could have spent a little bit more time, but uh, you know, just think about it. Uh, all localized detail is gonna kind of warp uh, into that shape that we wanted. This is a great deformer. If you already have a model with details already modeled in and you wanna step back and apply general changes to the overall shape. So that's the end of the video. I hope that you guys got tremendous value from this. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I know this video was a little bit different than I'm used to doing. And if you're interested in my Maya 3D modeling course and getting your portfolio or your projects reviewed, I'll go ahead and drop a link down in the description down below. Until we meet again, folks, I will catch you guys next time.